If you've been paying attention to the BJJ coaching scene, you might have noticed a new way of looking at teaching called ecological dynamics. But what is ecological dynamics and why is it finding a prominent place in jujitsu? If you were to Google ecological dynamics for BJJ, you might be met with faces like Greg Souter. Right, I, like I said, I don't teach specific sweeps or, or specific movement patterns. They don't exist to me. I don't see them anymore. And Ed Inglemills. The way I teach through a ecological framework or ecological dynamics framework. Your divide, your key divide at the moment is almost like cognitive and ecological. Both are incredibly intelligent and authorities in the relatively contemporary space. But honestly, both can use some terminology that can turn curious ears into confused minds. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? My ultimate goal with this conversation is to make the topic more palatable for those curious ears new to the topic. Today, I have Kabir Bath, a black belt under the legendary Rafael Lovato Jr. and owner of Kaboom BJJ. Kabir started his journey 17 years ago and opened his academy six years later as a purple belt, quickly earning his brown belt afterwards. A year ago, almost to the day, Kabir switched to teaching all of his classes in the ecological dynamics approach. In this conversation, we discuss what ecological dynamics ED is to him, the benefits of ED for beginners, common critiques and questions about ED, pros and cons of teaching ED, and then how to make ED the mainstream way of coaching in jiu-jitsu, plus much more. So sit back, relax, and grab a notepad. And maybe by the end of our conversation, you will have a better understanding of this growing approach to teaching sport. Kabir, how's it going today, man? Thank you so much for coming on <laughs> the, the episode today and uh, talking about your journey. And today, like we were talking about beforehand, I want to go over some uh, ecological approach to jujitsu. It's kind of taken uh, the jujitsu steam scene by storm, kind of right now. Um, I've, I've read some stuff online where I was like, man, there's it's there's really no gray area when it comes to this stuff. I feel like it's either you're a hundred percent for it or you're 100 percent against it you know what i mean like there's there's very few people out there i feel that that see like the gray area where it benefits and where it doesn't so but thank you so much for coming on the show today how you doing man i'm doing great i'm super excited dive in talk about jiu-jitsu perfect way to spend my afternoon yeah so thanks for having me man no problem you said you already you already got to train some this morning so just keep rolling with the <laughs> jiu-jitsu oh yeah <laughs> Every day, you know, I'm on the mats like six days a week. Oh like, my gosh, I wish, man. <laughs> if I if I make it to the gym twice a week, it's a it's a victory for me. You know what I mean? Like I, I, right. I'm that I'm at that point in my my journey right now where it's like uh, either I'm coaching or I'm in class. I can't do I can't do both during the week because I have two small ones and and so mm -hmm. it's like I gotta I gotta balance my priorities. So, but I'm excited to get back to class and start training again because lately it's just been coaching. Um, and mm -hmm. that's the reason I, like I mentioned before too, kind of want to talk today. So, but for the people at home that don't know who you are, can you go ahead and give a background of who you are and how you got into jujitsu? Yeah, hundred percent. So I'm Kabir Bath. I run Kaboom BJJ just outside of Vancouver, Canada. Um, I'm a black belt under Rafael Lovato Jr. Um, let's see what else, man. I mean, I got into jujitsu 17 years ago now, just on a random whim with a buddy. We thought we would do some trial classes and then beat each other up. I ended up doing one class, staying forever, been training pretty, like, I know people throw around like full time, but I've always been training like five to six days a week for like the last 17 years. And I've had my school now for the last 11 years. Uh, more relevant to this conversation is you know, we've been implementing this ecological stuff for now. It's actually over a full year. Of nice. All of our programs. Um, and it sort of was sort of something we just naturally matched up with because of some things we were already playing with and experimenting with that we had seen. And then we just dove all the way. I think it's like nearly right now, maybe exactly a year. Wow. I know September last year we started. I just had a chat one day with Greg. Um, later that day, I just changed my curriculum plan. And initially I was like, I'm going to do a four week sample. I'm going to commit. I'll teach every class in the schedule for the next four weeks. And I'll teach in this way. And I'm going to gain, I'm going to gather as much like feedback from the students. So that's sort of like how we got here. Um, I'm sort of known for like having a really strong kids programs, 
really strong jiu-jitsu business stuff that I do as well. Um, yeah, I'm excited to talk about anything and everything. Yeah. Support for today's episode comes from Waterboy. Waterboy is a hydration powder scientifically formulated to cut your hangover time in half. There are other hydration packs on the market, but nothing comes anywhere close to fighting those Sunday scaries like Waterboy. With zero sugar and over three times the electrolytes of liquid IV, your hangover doesn't even stand a chance. Unlike other competitors, Waterboy has added ingredients beyond just hydration to help with that nausea, the anxiety, and fatigue. For a limited time, our listeners will get 15% off your entire order with code elbows tight at waterboy.com. Waterboy not only sent me the weekend recovery, but they also sent me the athletic hydration recovery and i must say using the other electrolytes drinks waterboy is by far my favorite liquid iv has way too much sugar and causes me to have like a stomach ache uh, during practice and element is good but it's a little too salty for my taste waterboy has great taste and isn't overpowering with that sodium inside each stick there's ginger that helps with the nausea and to make your tummy feel better and there is also l-theanine to help calm your nerves and reduce your anxiety. Their scientifically backed formula truly brings back you from the dead. Waterboy is also gluten-free, caffeine-free, dairy-free, vegan, and most importantly, made in the USA. Hundreds of thousands of people already trust Waterboy as their hangover cure. For a limited time, my listeners will get 15% off when you use the code elbows tight at waterboy.com. That's 15% off with code elbows tight at waterboy.com. Waterboy has got you recovered. Support for today's episode comes from Marine Layer. It's official. I found the softest t-shirt mankind has ever made. Imagine the softest thing you've ever touched. Maybe kittens or freshly fallen snow. Now times that by 1000. Marine Layer is the go-to brand for great fitting and stylish closet staples. Based out of California, Marine Layer clothes are the perfect mix of laid back style and also looks and feels premium. What I love about Marine Layer is how their t-shirts stay soft no matter how many times you wash them. It's time to invest in the wardrobe that will actually last. For a limited time, our listeners get an exclusive 15% off discount with the code elbows tight 15 at marinelayer.com. As a dad and a husband, I rarely buy myself new clothes, but when I do, I want to make sure that they're quality. Marine Layer accomplished that and more. They have great bundle deals on t-shirt, socks, shirts, and much more. Also, not only is the quality great, but they also have in-between sizes and athletic fits as well. How many times have you felt that you were in between sizes when buying clothes? Maybe you've been drinking uh, a few too many lately, or you've been hitting the gym extra hard. You finally no longer have to make that difficult choice between medium and large, and large and extra large. Now, look no further than Marine Lair. For a limited time, get 15% off with the code elbows tight 15 at marinelayer.com. That's elbows tight 15 for 15% off your entire order at marinelayer.com. Saving your closet one shirt at a time. Let's do it. No, that's one thing I noticed too, because when I was, uh, we talked about it to, on Discord, we we're both in the ecological dynamics for BJJ Discord. Um, and I noticed when I was trying to find you, the first thing that popped up was actually your kids program on Instagram. And you have a massive following for your kids program also. Uh, how, how was how was your teaching in the kids affected you, like coaching the adults? Did you see any like, uh, I want to say, like turnover? I, I'm, I'm like trying to think of the word. <laughs> but does it do they benefit each other when having such a strong kids program? Yeah. So, um, we'll talk about this in two ways. Like one, there's the natural benefit of having a good, strong kids program is that's how you get really good juvenile blue, purple belts that turn into your young, awesome black belts. We're starting close to having that start to happen in the next oh, five nice. years here, which is exciting. Um, but the, the real benefit is for us, kids is a structure. You know, you have to have structure, you have to have planning, you have to understand so much about your audience, how to communicate. All these things are so valuable when it comes to coaching children. Um, that's why you have to be a professionally trained teacher. You know, there's so many skills that go into it. So for us, when we really started to focus on our kids program, that's really what got me into 
like coaching pedagogy as a whole and why I would be studying other sports. How, how do they run this hockey practice? How do they run this basketball practice? How do they introduce skill? What are, what's, what's long-term athlete development? These are all things that we gained exposure to because we were looking at it for our youth program, how to better implement things there. Um, so we gained so many skills. And I mean, Hey, could I have done this for the adult thing? Adult side? Yes. But everyone knows that you sort of just feel like you can just teach adults. So you just come in, you show them stuff. They're fully grown humans. Obviously this is a very easy thing. Whereas for kids, you can, you, with that like approach, you have much more negative consequences because you, you know, you have to keep them engaged. You have to keep them moving. You have to keep them growing. You have to keep them learning. You have to make sure the challenge level is just right. There's so much that is important. So our sort of like expertise in that area, you know, allowed all of our coaches to be quite good at what we do. You know, we take it very seriously. Um, so because of that, we have like a really coaching rich sort of culture at the school. The way we approach coaching is like quite serious. Um, and then, so in our kids program, we were very, we have done, dude, I've done everything in a kids program in terms of, cause it's like, you know, when I opened my school, I, I had just got my brown belt. So I was like, okay, let's see what these guys are doing for kids programs. I'm like, cool, obstacle courses, got it. I'm like, wait a second, what a waste of time, you know? And then it's like, okay, give them <laughs> stickers for this to get their behavior. Okay, that seems, you know, like I tried all the things, and at the end of it, you know, we sort of realized, like, hey, the best thing is make it a great practice with no downtime, maximal engagement. Make sure they progress every time. Make sure they feel connected with every time. And you can really do something special with these athletes. Um, and then through all that, you know, eventually we came to this realization that like, man, if you look at sports like soccer and stuff, they are trying to get away from things like having kids wait out in line to do drills. They don't really spend much time like just teaching, right? Like there's like a thing, like no laps, no lectures, no lines, like no laps is like no physical exercises, punishment, no lectures, don't waste time with them talking, right? No lines, don't have kids sitting out. So I took those principles and implemented them into our class. And then it naturally sort of lended itself to me starting to explore like small sided games, because that's a thing they do in soccer to get a lot of touches. Um, and then that sort of started being so before I heard like Greg and doing eco stuff with the adults. My kids program was already about 50% live training through games with little objectives. They were broader, more maybe akin to like, you know, but they, they were broad, but I still had like, Hey, practice and move, repeat the steps, et cetera, that type of stuff too. Um, yeah. So it had already sort of led me to start thinking about a lot of this stuff because I saw it working in that, population so what made you you mentioned that you started your academy at uh, brown belt what made you decide to open your own academy because law school sucked so i was in <laughs> law school um i was doing pretty well but every partner at every firm that i ever like interned or did like a summer thing at would always encourage me to drop out and just go open a jiu-jitsu school because like really? you're obviously smart enough you don't shut up about it you're running the university's grappling club. You are in this city doing a summer job and you already found a jiu-jitsu school here. Like this is clearly a passion. If it doesn't work, just come back here. You're, you know, but yeah. So I honestly, every time I've had any interaction with the lawyer, they pretty much encouraged me to not do it. Um, so yeah, I dropped out after my first summer. I used all the money I made working as a, like a one L at a corporate firm, used that to open my school the next summer. That's crazy. Were you ever nervous when you first opened your academy? I know a lot of people that listen. Well, not a lot, but there's quite a few people that listen to my show that own their own academy that aren't necessarily black belts. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm sure they've probably felt, you know, opening the doors has got to be a pretty nerve wracking thing, especially when you're leaving a job like a lawyer, even though, you know, everyone's telling you to go do jujitsu. Was there any like, oh, man, what am I doing? Well, Obviously, because like, hey, so I'm in law school. I just finished my first year. I'm crushing it. I'm probably, you know, like in the top percentile of the class. There's obviously many good things down mm -hmm. this pathway for sure. Um, but I just couldn't really ignore it. I was so young. I was like 25. I was full, like, you know, 
it, it just, there was the best time to do something like that was right then. I felt, you know, because time I would not get more. Of. So if I'm going to explore this, I want to explore this early in early in my life, you know, in that sense. Um, and of course it was nervousness, but sort of like a chaotic guy in some regards. Like I didn't even have a business plan when I opened, I had $10,000 cash. And then that allowed me to get a $10,000 credit card limit. So I had $20,000 and then I just flew by the seat of my pants my, <laughs> month after month on and on. It can be nerve wracking, especially because like, actually I, I realized I opened when I was a purple belt. I got my brown belt like a month later after oh, okay. opening. So like, but still I opened as a purple belt. There were already black belts in my city where my school was. Um, yeah, it's always going to be nerve wracking. Anything like everything is nerve wracking. You know, when you think of it, just taking on that challenge, sort of trying to make it happen. Um, but then I, I, so an interesting thing I did is between dropping out of law school and opening my school, I started going to martial arts business events. Mm. So I was already trying to learn about how the business worked. So that sort of helped me have some confidence in that. And somewhere in one of those things, it's like the only person that like one of the presenters or something was like, Hey, the only person that really cares about your rank is people who are already doing it. People who aren't doing it really just want to see that you care about them, you know, that you That's have, you know, like the, the attitudinal qualities of an instructor are far more important to 80% of humans than the technical or the achievement based qualities of an instructor. And when I heard that, I'm like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I've actually seen it because I have um, friends who they had, they were running an academy as blue and purple belts in Chicago very competitive jiu mm -hmm. area super successful school now they're like brown brown belts i think yeah brown belt is still the highest rank at the school but wow. that was like five years ago and they were still one of the best schools in the area lots of students great culture all that stuff and it's just like it doesn't it doesn't matter as much as you think you know what really matters is can you deliver a good service can you make people feel seen heard and help them grow yeah the one thing that i i kind of draw the parallel to is coming from crossfit and weightlifting mm -hmm. uh a a great coach in weightlifting you can have a coach that has multiple olympic athletes that has never been olympian that has never been to the olympic himself and it doesn't take away from their ability as a coach to provide value like you mentioned and make their students or their athletes that much better when you when you first started coaching how how long did it take you to like find your own voice? Because I know when I was a, a beginning coach, I was kind of like just mimicking what my coach was mm -hmm. saying to people. And I was like, well, he said this cue, so I'm going to give this cue. And it took me probably about, you know, six, seven months of me coaching continuously by myself to really like start finding my own voice. How long until you, uh, you found your own voice and how you like to coach? Yeah, so it's really interesting. So I actually taught my first ever class as like a three or four stripe white belt to like oh, wow. around like a yeah it was just like a random thing but i ended up teaching at the end of my first year of jiu-jitsu and then after that the only things i ever did were teach and train like pretty much so one interesting thing is like at that time schools were not nearly as well structured they are now with curriculum and plans and whatever so it's like whatever class i run i was just teaching whatever i wanted to teach <laughs> you know so it yeah. ended up being like and there wasn't a there wasn't a pre prescribed formula of how to run the session, you know, or what to do. So for me, I sort of found my voice fairly quick because I didn't have an expectation to fit. Like the mm. way classes were, were so random anyways, it didn't really matter. Hey, just how do I set? Like, I remember like, dude, I used to do stuff that no one at my school was doing. Like we, I, no one at my school for some reason ever let partner a drill for three minutes straight and then partner b drill for three minutes straight i'm like but this makes sense i'm just going to start doing like this and like you know like because there was no prescribed structure i really never felt that i just thought i could mm. do whatever you know like because i started off teaching like the crappiest class you know the friday night class that my coach called lonely hearts jiu-jitsu club <laughs> you know <laughs> like uh um, that's we had I, one of those you know, too. That's what we said. Yeah. It's like, if you're here on Fridays, it's because you have no personal life. <laughs> yeah. And, and I just found like my voice. And it was interesting though, because then when I was a blue belt, I'm like, oh shit, there's like a black belt in my class. And I remember when that first happened, I'm like, oh, I can either be really self 
conscious or I can just show what I would do and why I would do it and explain it. And then like, it was totally, you know, they were there to learn. And that was like the big thing I had to remember is, Oh, everyone's just here to learn. They're hoping to get something out of it. Um, yeah. So it, that it, it can be a thing that makes you super hesitant, but I just found just it, no one really, not no one really cared, but it's really easy to find your voice when you're just passionate about it. You know, mm-hmm. like I just really wanted to share jujitsu. I wanted to share the things I was good at. Did I probably only teach butterfly guard and knee cut passes <laughs> for 18 months? Probably, probably, you know, but it was fine. Yeah. That's, that's one thing that I'm dealing with now is like, because I teach the fundamentals class. So it's typically all beginners. So I'm not too worried about them, you know, been like that doesn't really make sense like why would you do that it's when like my 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 fellow blue belts show up you know what i mean and it's like we only have one purple belt in our entire academy two blue or two brown belts one black belt and then like five blue belts five or six blue belts so we're Mm -hmm. a really small academy but whenever they show up to my fundamentals class whenever i'm coaching them i'm like please like please don't sound like an idiot please (laughs) like to your point like i'm like Oh, man, I get a little self-conscious, but now that I'm starting to do it more, now I'm starting to feel more comfortable um, because, I don't know, I, I still feel so new in jujitsu, mm-hmm. even though I've been doing it for like five and a half years. I still feel so new in the aspect of like being able to describe why I would do something. It's 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 something that it takes a little bit to to get over. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's mm-hmm. definitely, definitely um, the more you do it, the more comfortable you feel just like anything with jujitsu. How, how do you uh, build that confidence in your coaches when you start bringing them up? Yeah. So I find for most people when the, so I actually give them some structure, some stuff to mm. follow, some good, you know, like nothing is like a good class plan makes it very easy to feel confident. Yeah. Cause you know, you've thought about it or someone has thought about it rather, you know, you know what it should look like when it's, a success, right? Like what does winning look like? You sort of want to know what a good class looks like. Um, so there's things I do, like, for example, I always teach the first classes of the week before anyone else will teach a class. So before any of my other instructors teach Monday, I teach every class because then they can see the session in action, what I was sort of hoping for, what the outcomes were, whatever. Um, so that's one half of it. The second half is working with instructors on some of those skills, communication, um, you know, just the, the, the skills they need to be an effective coach in itself. How do you correct? How do you, you know, pacing all those type of things? Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely the thing that's helped me the most is I write a, a class out timestamps, exactly what I want to do, how long I'm going to talk, mm-hmm. the key points I want to talk about how long each game's going to go. You know what I mean? I'm like, I have 45 minutes. I have to use it as uh, effectively and as efficiently as possible. So it doesn't, one thing that I've noticed it, it doesn't allow me to go off on these tangents or rambles because I have the next thing that I'm supposed to go over right there in front of me instead of talking about something because I'm nervous for five, 10 minutes and (laughs) completely losing myself in the winds. So um, that's, that, that, that has helped me out quite a bit. And if you guys want at home, if you guys want to see my, my class notes, I could, uh, put them over in the Facebook group if you guys want. But so when you first opened your Academy, obviously for a while, you didn't do the ecological stuff. What was your class structure like before you kind of started taking over the, the whole ecological dynamics? Yeah. So honestly, like pretty much the classic cookie cutter, some sort of random, either calisthenic or movement, or maybe partner drill based warm up, a series of positions, maybe related, maybe like a system, you know, of some sort drilling that, and then probably 15 minutes of live training at the end, like the most stereotypical jujitsu class in the universe, except, except I did usually do like very little warming up because I just thought that wasn't a huge return after a point you know um that the jiu-jitsu is more important but it was the most basic stuff yo here's the sequence we're going to drill it a b c and then that's your steps you know work on it hey like i was never really like a a big convoluted sequence guy i still tried to really keep things small chunk it appropriately and whatever else but man very typical format towards the 
the end, we'll say, you know, I started incorporating more sort of like mini games. Like, hey, we're going to say we're learning the knee cut pass. We're going to start all the way at the end of the knee cut pass and just finish it against your partner. They're going to re- try and stop you. You finish it. Now we're starting here where you've just gotten past that top knee shield and you're in. Finish the pass. Now you're here. You're in headquarters. Working. So I had started to like play with that, which is why I was already very curious about how could I implement it on a bigger level, I guess. How much like conceptual ideas of jujitsu did you teach before that also? Did you did you really give the the why we do stuff or was it simply the like you mentioned ABC, this is how we do? Honestly, mostly a lot of like ABC. I it wasn't until the like the pandemic was a great big coaching reset for me too, because I had up here in like BC Canada. We had like several periods of time where we just couldn't run real adult classes where they could yeah. do partner work. So that's why I was really deep diving on learning. And that was like the first time that I really dove into like the concepts side of jutsu. Cause I was never like, there's like concepts that like my coach had passed on through like, you know, just random side of the mat lessons, you know, that you get that usually are just like feedback points. But as far as instructing, I had never really used it as part of my teaching method. Um, you know, and even, even, you know, the initial initial was still very much like still move, move, move. Even at, even after I started to think of it more, but my lesson would be like how to illustrate this concept. I'm going to choose some things that will show this idea in action, you know, but I, I was never really an outward, like here's the principles of play that we're using in this situation or whatnot. What was the first concept that you heard that really stuck with you uh, till this day? Um, well, I've always really liked, uh, you know, uh, Rob Bernanke. He has mm-hmm. a good little, his little alignment theory, you know, base structure, posture or something, you know. I thought that was a really easy way for me to start communicating what you sort of want to be happening in a lot of situations. So that was one that, that was my first real, when I first started to dive into like exploring some concepts, obviously that's like his big thing, right? BJJconcepts.net or something, whatever, you know, that that's his whole thing. Um, but it was good because, like, oh, man, this just makes thinking so much easier. If I can simplify these things into, like, almost nothing. You know, like, these are very basic ideas. Oh, structure. Hey, their limb. If it's away from their body, you know, like, what are we doing to their limbs? Base. Can you generate force? Can you absorb force? Posture. Talking about the spine. Like, okay, that makes sense. And that's an easy way to, like, problem solve any little situation you're having while rolling something's going bad, one of those things is not happening for you or two of those things or all three of those things, you know? Um, so that was like the first sort of like concept thing that really influenced me there. So we, we've given a little bit of background of how you got into jiu-jitsu, how you got into coaching and how you've progressed as a coach leading up to this last year of where we've grabbed, you know, you grabbed ecological and taken it full, full swing at your academy. Um, What was that final deciding factor before we get into your whole approach to ecological dynamics in your academy? What was that final uh, catalyst to throw you over the edge to to actually take it on? Yeah, so I'd play, I like I had mentioned, I've been playing with games in class. I've been doing some stuff with resistance as training. And then I stumbled upon like that Primal MMA podcast and there was an Mm -hmm. episode and one of my friends sent to me, he's like, hey, check this out. This guy only does games. I'm like, no shit. Someone actually does. Guys, you know, studying all the other sports, there are many examples of coaches who are running their sessions in this way for, for as mostly like ball sports, you know, like mm-hmm. basketball, hockey, whatever, you know, things like that. It wasn't really like, you know, I I had heard a little bit of like Cal Jones doing it in judo and stuff like that, but I had never heard of anyone like doing it all the way in jiu-jitsu with like adults as well was like a big thing so when i heard that greg was doing it um i think like after i heard it i just like called him or we spoke we talked once in for like two hours one day and then after that that night i just like i was like okay i'm gonna try this i can't half-heartedly try it if i'm gonna evaluate it because for me like my business Anytime I implement a change or I want to test something, I have to give myself like a legit sample size 
too often I find people like they don't make progress because they try something and then they move on, try something else. And they try something else. I mean, I was like, yo, if I'm going to do it, I'm not just going to do a game here or there. I'm just going to do four weeks, nothing but this style of training. And then that was it. So then that was, like I said, a little over a year, just flipped the switch. Cause I was already leaning that way in a lot of ways. Like a lot of my class was already like not static drilling anymore. I was all like, Hey, your partner is moving. We're just going to keep following them and trying to get underhooks and they're clearing underhooks. And we're moving. And, you know, we started playing stuff like that. Um, but nothing that was like all the way, like true resistance in that sense. Have you talked to, uh, um, uh, Lovato Jr., Rafael Lovato Jr. about this? And has he ever, like, said, like, oh, man, that's a great idea, and, like, maybe we should try that, too? Um, You know, we've talked about it a little bit, but not super deep. Um, But it's interesting, though, because if we think of when we're talking about, like, developing my own game, let's say, is never go drill this thing a million times. It's like, hey, figure out how it works and then start putting yourself in that situation over and over and doing it live and then scaling it and da 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 da, da you know? But as far as like the implementation and working on it and as a tool, not really. We, we've definitely like talked about it, but here's one thing. It can always just look like situational sparring, right? Yeah, we'll and get into that too. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so can you give me your definition? You know, we, we joked about it too before, uh, that you have a more palatable way of, a uh, of describing, uh, the whole ecological approach. Uh, what, what would, in your words, what is it and how is it different from situational sparring? Yeah. So here's what I think is the big difference and i won't get like super science here or whatever because it's just i think we're here to just make it palatable and something you can engage with um for me it's all about the way one of course hey everything's live that's a very big part of it right we want to be doing stuff in an environment that is the true environment where we will use that skill the main thing is learning to read what's happening it's so important for every sport jujitsu included right we need to be able to react, be able to see what's actually going on. So for me, that was like a big thing. But so that's one half, right? But I find a lot of it is the way you present these games where really the attention, attention idea is the biggest thing for me. Like that's what makes it so useful and effective is that I can present this and I can just show you where to search for answers, right? and what outcomes you want to be making happen. And it's just such a simple framework for like, I routinely will have day one people come in, do class, and they can do things, they can understand what's happening. And I doubt I would have had a similar, you know, sort of result in another situation. So for me, like the biggest thing is how can I put people in narrow situations, not necessarily narrow, but how can I give them the information that makes them look at the situation in such a way that now they're trying to have a lot of time on task, right? Where they're doing the right thing. Because for me, like the difference between yourself and me, jujitsu skill wise, is you're probably off task more than I am mm. when we're rolling, right? So I think of it as a system for me to train you to focus on the important things and how to create certain effects in the other person. So that's always been the thing that's really drawn me to why it's so valuable. If I can just get you on task very often and have you understand what's important and what is going to happen when we accomplish those important things. And because I give you so much frequency, you can actually figure out how to calibrate your body to make those effects happen. That, that is why I've really done. Also, I just realized I didn't really explain what it is, but (laughs) You know, but like that, I think that's the more important thing. I don't, I don't think like me telling you with the science of like, Hey, you can't separate perception and action. Their length is going to help you like understand why you would want to play around with this so much as understanding that thought that if I can get you to understand what the task is, what you want to accomplish and what type of solutions or where you should be looking to solve that problem, 
you know, that is very effective. That's just like, you know, that, that it's like a fast track you, you know, if I can get you in those scenarios. Um, yeah. So that's like sort of for me when I think of it, I like, I've read all the sciencey stuff. I love all the science stuff. I have to understand it. It's great. But I never feel like that's what I need to lean on to communicate why people should adopt or try it, at, like a real legit prolonged try. Um, I won't go super hard into it, right? But just understanding that the learning happens from the doing, you know, in the simplest way we can put it and it's how do I guide what you are going to do to put those affordances in front of you so you can have the opportunities to take actions that are meaningful in that moment, right? That are, whether or not they're the right action, the opportunity for you to explore and play with them and sort of think of it through that lens, you know? The constraints-led approach is like, you know, if, if someone was like, hey, what should I start learning about? Just learn about CLA, right? It's under the umbrella, you know, and it's probably the most commonly used thing um, when it comes to it, but that's where you would want to start, you know, making sure that you can understand what are we trying to motivate? Okay, there's the task, there's the performer, there's the environment, right? Those are the three things at play. In Jiu-Jitsu, obviously, you would be the performer. The environment is probably, hey, it's their partner, it's gi, no gi, equipment, all of that type of stuff falls into that. But a lot of what you're going to do is on the task, right? How do we choose good tasks to bring out skill? And that's sort of like a big thing is like, hey, we want to put you in situations where you discover this skill or you explore this landscape where the skill is going to come into play. Um, yeah, and I didn't get some sciency, but you just have to like understand what the objective is, right? The objective is put athletes in situations where they can be engaged learners and engage with the material because that is what will give you the solution, right? That is where you will learn how to move your body, how to put your weight, what you need to do when you have the right task focus, right? And that's why a lot of it, like I say, say if I can get you a lot of time on task, you will learn a lot of the right things. That's yeah, that's I, I think ta I put it in my head. I put it as like a uh, task oriented. I wouldn't I don't want to say drilling because drilling has this connotation in jujitsu where we're just repping, doing the same mm -hmm. thing over and over again. But I guess task oriented game. So uh, for people at home, what I do for like my beginners class is uh, you have someone on your back. Uh, the person that is defending your goal is to break chest to ch or chest to back connection, get off center line. However, you want to do that. Just think about that. And then the person on the back, your goal is to either stay on the back as long as possible, or if you can submit, submit or whatever, like break, break grips and, and whatnot. And that's how I kind of think about, and that's, you mentioned too, CLA constraint led approach where we're giving people tasks within a certain environment to, to promote a reaction that we want to teach a skill, right? It's kind of like how. I'm trying not to sound sciencey either, but sometimes, <laughs> but sometimes it does sound a little sciencey. Um, and it's 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 cool because the the thing that I've noticed with it is when beginners come to class, they are very hesitant to roll because they don't know what to do. And with the with this method, it allows them to roll and allows them to train, but not overwhelm them with, uh, well, I don't know what to do in this situation, because you tell them exactly what you want them to do in this situation. Have you noticed that uh, the benefits it had for uh, beginning practitioners over the uh, typical drilling repetitions over and over again? Yeah. So for me, the biggest benefit is that it provides a new athlete with context what am i trying to accomplish in this scenario right the sooner i can give you like all the signposts so you know what we're trying to go to where we're trying to go what we want to try and accomplish the easier it is like when you really understand the goals of all these different exchanges whether it's a standing exchange a guard a pin whatever when you know what you're trying to accomplish it makes it much easier because you, if i teach you like a, a side escape from, you know, a pin doesn't really teach you why or what you're trying to accomplish. It just shows you a way that a thing can happen. You know, you can, you can go from here to here. Cool. You know, and you can sort of, but like when, 
you direct it as like, hey, this is going to be our primary objective is we're going to be here, your goal to get your limbs back in between you and your partner here. You know, or like just, I find that helps so much because now what I see is like my new students, they can grapple. They can play all of grappling. Are they great? Not necessarily because they're still novices, <laughs> still, <yeah>. right? right. <laughs> but they can play the whole game. They can wrestle, they can pass, they can pin, they can sweep, they can submit. They know how positions link because they've played so many games and so many situations out that they have the actual time to like capture the experience points needed. You know, I was thinking like a video game, like you're trying to like catch like experience and awareness points in this one area. So let me put you there. So you can actually figure out what's happening. Um, so for us, for beginners, it's awesome. Like now we actually have a lot of beginners that like compete and they are like the reason we win team trophies and stuff oh, nice. now, or like get, you know, get on that team podium. It's like, wow, they all know how to play the, mo- the whole game. Right. Um, which is neat because they like one thing that is actually a very interesting side effect, let's say is I used to see a lot more pausing in the way people rolled. They would get somewhere, stop and think, mm-hmm. or stop and hold, or, you know, whatever. Whereas now, I notice my students, they're always, always trying to address something. You know, their attention is always on, okay, okay. It's not like they don't pause anywhere, really. They're always trying to advance. It doesn't mean that there's, like, just wild amount of movements but there's a little grip fight happening because they understand how important that is or they're trying to you know do whatever um that's been an interesting thing i've noticed is that they're constantly working their work rate is much higher just because i think i think it's partly because they know what to do if i have to think of what move is going to help me deal with this situation i've now paused i've thought i don't do anything and then i have to do everything really like eh like tense because now I wasted a bunch of time. So I have to muscle or I have to yeah. do whatever. Whereas I'm just always engaged with it. You can have like a huge benefit, right. In the way that you roll. So that's actually one big sort of unexpected byproduct is I just noticed the way that they roll is so much different. Gentlemen, First impressions matter. And if you're not taking care of your skin, that's going to be the first thing someone notices and instantly thinks you're way older than you are or you don't care about your appearance. Show them you do and make a great first impression with Caldera Lab. Caldera Lab reached out to me to promote their products and I gave it a month try before even bringing it on the podcast. And as someone that has had adult set on acne and growing up, my skin has always been a problem with me. It was something that I was a little bit hesitant about, but I I'm super excited that I've started to work with them. Their stuff is phenomenal. I use it twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening, and my face has never felt better. In jujitsu, we often make the joke that <laughs> jujitsu adds lots of years onto your life and makes you look way older than you really are. Well, with Caldera Lab, you can stop that and you can make yourself look your age again. Whether you're an older practitioner or a younger practitioner, Caldera Lab has something for you and their products are great. Caldera Lab knows the skincare world is heavily female driven and has long been the wild west for men. That's why they're making the solution simple. The regimen includes three products, the clean slate, the base layer, and the good. The clean state starts and ends every day. The base layer is a daily moisturizer to hydrate your skin and jumpstart your day full of confidence. The good is a multifunctional serum at night that helps your skin look tighter and smoother as well to help it reduce visible wrinkles and fine lines. And just for our audience, 20% off with code elbows tight at calderalab.com and make unforgettable first impressions that lean to the charming words, you look younger. Once again, that's 20% off at calderalab.com using code elbows tight or click the link down in the description below and use code elbows tight for 20% off. Thank you, Caldera Lab, for sponsoring this episode. Fresh ball fall is upon us and you need to be in the festive spirit. Light a candle and get some pumpkin spice and make sure your balls look nice 
with today's sponsor, Manscaped. Nature may clear the leaves for their trees, but you'll need Manscaped to get ready for that sweater weather. Get your pants puppies prepared for cuffing season with a trim that's refreshing as the fall breeze going to manscaped.com using code ETP20 for 20% off and free shipping. I remember the first time I trimmed my balls uh, and it was a nightmare. To give a visual idea of how bad it was, my balls looked like Jim Carrey's The Grinch when he shaved his face for the first time. Now, instead of hearing, look at that hack job in my head, now I hear, oh, those are some good looking jewels. But now you've heard of them, but it's time you join the 9 million men worldwide using Manscaped to get the kit that covers it all, the Performance Package 4.0. Bring the fall in right and get 20% off and free shipping with code ETP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com using code ETP20. As the leaves fall, make sure you have it all with Manscaped. I definitely, I've noticed that too when I was doing my, I, I like to do like a guard passing warm up game where it's very, very simple. They, top player just moves laterally, bottom player is just trying to make four points of contact, keep, keep long frames in front of them. And however you guys do that, you just, and then I progressively get it to where the top player. Uh, tries to make chest to chest connection or chest to back connection, whatever it is, whatever I'm going to go into for that day. So whether it's we're going to do mount, side control, uh, back back control, or whatever it is, then we kind of go into that. Um, but it it's cool because, like you mentioned, a guy passed my guard, like he was like been doing jujitsu for like four months, and I was like, oh, did you like legit just <laughs> pass my guard? I wasn't expecting that. Like that's super cool. Um, but you know, there's there's been some 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 uh information not information but hesitancy that there might be burnout when it comes to uh the ecological approach right because people are constantly doing jujitsu right so there's the the possibility of bigger or higher injury risks and then also uh people could get bored you know doing doing that and not learning something is that something that you you've experienced yet um not really truthfully i feel like now people train more mm. so here's the thing things are fun when you don't suck at them <laughs> very <true>. right <laughs> so if we're getting better and you can see that you're getting better you tend to enjoy what's happening right and even here's here's another thing you will enjoy when you know why things are going wrong it doesn't suck it's not as negative as an experience Right. So if I know what goal I'm failing to achieve and what I'm like not addressing and I'm, I'm losing this outcome, that's a lot more easy for me to handle than just getting smashed and sparring. Oh, I don't know what's going wrong. You know, so I find because of the way that people are sort of focus on stuff, they enjoy training more, whether it's good or bad for them, whether they're getting smashed or they're doing smashing or whatever. Um, when it comes to sort of, hey, are, like you don't get it's hard to imagine getting bored like would you be bored if you liked basketball would it be boring to play basketball games all the time no if i love basketball and I, i'm there to play basketball i think it would be amazing to always play basketball <laughs> exactly right you'd want to get the ball and another player and see who can score you know or whatever um so i i understand but here's the thing big unsexy thing is grappling is sort of boring it's like one task that we're trying to do all the time right we're just trying to pin people so we can break them right or stop them from doing that to us it's all that's really happening a lot of like the obsession not obsession let's say but people really like learning techniques yeah because that was like a new new thing because humans love learning period we just love learning shit you know um so we can be learning that's great um but like it i don't see people like my students don't really care about because here's also an interesting thing that happens though is they can go learn because now they know what's going wrong and they mm. know what's important in this situation and they think about things a little bit differently so i find more than ever before, my students actually come in with questions about things that are happening or about positions or about certain exchanges that are sort of taking place. 
um, on the map. You know, so I don't really find the boredom because, hey, they're making progress and they're, they're actually engaging with the subject matter, the whole class. The other thing that I find the reason people aren't like getting bored is, man, there's so much winning and losing in a session. There's so much activity. Like you feel good after training. Your, your best days at Jiu Jitsu are probably ones where you got to do a bunch of live training. You yeah. just feel great after all that like physical work, you know? Um, when it comes to the getting worn out stuff, you know, getting beat up, volume is volume. You know, we increased the volume and that's just sort of a fact of life. But how often does your average jujitsu student come? 1.8 times a week, you know, because mm-hmm. every school has that core group that's there three, four, five times a week. But a large majority of the school is probably only there two to three times per week. Yeah. Right. If we were going to go lift weights and I was like, yo, do a full body workout, you'd probably just do it three times a week. You wouldn't do it every day because it's a taxing thing. It's okay for it to be a taxing thing. You know who can eventually do a full body workout every day? Somebody who's been doing it for a long time. They've just yeah. built up that capacity. And that's all really that is. You know, it's a separate thing. It's not that, it's not that, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just the volume of work is higher and you have to understand that. But you can do things to mitigate. You can make sure that you do different areas of the game each day. We'll do some guard. We'll do some chest to back. We'll do maybe a submission isolation type scenario. You know, I won't spend a full week on just one thing because yes, there will be, if we do just Darce scenarios for a week and skills around that, everyone's neck will be on yeah. sideways by the end of the week. <laughs> yeah. One class and I'm like, oh, <laughs> exactly. Right. So it's, it's, there's going to be some planning that you'll have to do, you know, to, but you would do that with anything. <laughs> like if you look at someone who's very serious about like their strength training and you s- said you have some success, bro, they have like spreadsheets that are like 16 yep. weeks out with their volume. Everything is calculated is to the day. 60%. Yep. This day I'm going to go 80% on this one, 60% on this lift. It's my primary, secondary, accessory lifts. Like mm-hmm. when you're dealing with fall, like it's just what you'll have to do. And also there's user engagement because guess what? We do the same thing every day. It does not mean that you have to come and do all the games at eight out of tens and go hard. Like that's the other things you just learn how to pace, how to manage your own energy and things like that too. Yeah, one one thing that I noticed, because um, obviously, like I've been digging deep into it and watching a lot of podcasts, and I've read Rob Gray's uh, "How We Learn to Move" and whatnot. And one thing that a lot of uh, teachers or even practitioners, I guess you could say, within the community, are, uh, talk about: Why would I not give my student all the tools that I've learned already to uh, better themselves in these situations? You know, what I'm saying they're saying. Why would I not just tell them how to get out of how to get out of side control? Why would I make them figure it out when I already have the information? What do you think when you see comments like that about the the whole ecological approach? Yeah, I, I hear that, and you know, it's like, hey, we're we're here for the shortcut, right? Essentially, is a lot of people is like, hey, we should be getting that fast track thing. Is it really a fast track thing if it doesn't transfer though? If you don't retain it, if you can't actually do it, right? It's not really, I'm not really helping you. My, the the way I am going to best leverage my experience is to put you in scenarios with the right amount of challenge so you can appreciate what should happen in that scenario and what's important in that scenario and what you want to, you know, like that's how I use all of my experience. I don't use all of my experience by saying, oh, every time you're pinned, A, B, C, D, E, yeah. boom, out. I do that by, hey, every time you're pinned, you want to be looking for places where we can get our limbs back inside, whether that's the hips, the between the ear and the shoulder, the armpit, there's going to be spaces. You're going to have to off balance people to get your limbs back inside probably. You're going to have to create movement to do so. We're going to play a game, start, you know, like, that's how I use my experience is I give them like that minimum effective dose in the perfect situation to explore and play. You know, I'm not just, like, here's the other thing too, is people, 
I say people, but oftentimes people are like, well, what do you do? You just put them in side control and say, get out. No, no one, no one is doing no one that. Does bro. It. Yeah. No one is doing that. If they are, they don't know what's really supposed to happen because I'm going to be in side control and then tell you what your goal is. Hey, you're going to try and put your, get your limbs back in and get them out of this chest to chest fin. I'm going to tell you what to focus on to try and make that happen. Focus on getting inside position. Focus on off balancing them. Focus on creating movement so that they have to harder time. You know, like things like that. And then, like, you know, in that because when I'm explain, okay, so when I play the game and I sh- talk about a win outcome, I probably demonstrate a win win outcome. I just yep. don't. I just don't break it down. I don't, you know, show you all the lines of like every little part. And even if you watch like videos of other people who teach in this fashion, when they describe a game, they have to demonstrate a solution at some point, (laughs) right? There is no video of someone standing up, just verbalizing game and saying, play, right? You have to sort of show what that might look like, or you should be in that sense because humans learn super good through mimicking, right? So let me show you what winning might look like. Um, and it's not, it's not like I'm giving you the answer because I'm going to show you, Hey, you know, it might be some stuff like this. You might have to use your arms. You might think of how can I get their head off my body to create space, you know, things like that. Um, that, but that's how you're going to use all of my experiences. I'm going to, I'm going to figure out what's important, what you should be focused on, where those solutions are more likely to emerge, right? That's how I use my experience to help you in that way. That's always been like my thought with regards to that sort of common sort of like objection. Creek Mickelson talked about it on the Sonny Brown podcast with Greg and then Sonny about he has a hard time figuring out what his role is now as a coach that he's implemented it. How, how do you o- overcome that? Like staying true to letting them figure it out and then still cueing them or giving them uh, things to look for without giving them the answer. I, I kind of attribute it to like, I'm not going to do my son's homework for him, but I'm going to lead him as far as I can until he figures it out. You know what I mean? Like how, how, how mm-hmm. do you approach it as a coach now that you aren't telling them exactly what they need to do? Right. You know, and um, so here's the thing. It just requires you to use different language, internal cues versus external cues. You know, if you are familiar with that, it's where like the way you're going to coach is going to have to be different too. And it should already have sort of been leaning that way too, you know, rather than me telling you to like get a frame in, right. I, I would rather tell you to get his head off your body, right. Mm-hmm. Try using your arms to do that. Try off balancing to do that, whatever it is. Um, to the more broader question of like, what's the role of the coach now? It's the same. It's the role that most coaches in other sports have watching practice, seeing what's happening. What do we need to work on? And then thinking, how can I take what I've seen here as raw data and make it into an actionable training plan so that we can have progress, right? That's sort of one of our primary functions. Because before our function was look up a random move, teach random move, that's it, right? That's a very passive process. Now, and it's funny because people will make it seem like it's going to be like you're going to be super hands off. I feel like I'm secretly more hands on because I'm watching everything and I'm trying to remind you of what you should be focused on, right? And over and over and over. So like now my job is the analyst, you know, I, my biggest thing is how can I, you know, practice design? How can I create the practice that'll help what I see in this room? Because for example, like some days I'll just, my first game that I do will be super broad and I'll see what people are naturally doing. I'm like, okay, good. I'm going to make the next game around this. Hmm. We were doing like, for example, we're doing some sort of game off a body lock. And I was like, hey, top player, your goal is to get, you know, chest to chest, you know, past the legs finally. Bottom player, you're just trying to get back to seated and break and break the lock. Right. And then when I was playing with that constraints, I can see they're doing certain things. Like, ah, everyone here to stop this is turning hard to their knees and then turning back in. So let me 
let me do a little bit of a course correct and make a rear body lock or a chest back exposure also win for the top player. You know, like that's what you, you have to start looking at is how can I create a scenario that will help push their skills in the right way, you know? Um, that I think becomes a lot more the role because it is true, dude, before I used to have to be like, not a happy, I was like, I was like happy to be the guy who knew the 93 details for this <laughs> sick arm bar from Mount. Now my arm bar from Mount is so, so whack. Like not so whack, but it's like, Hey, stay connected to their shoulder, keep them on the mat, separate their hands, extend their arm over a hard part of your body. You know, like. That's not that sexy, but there are things I can be, you know, telling the folks on while trying to accomplish that. And that's like the real thing. Um, but yeah, the role does change, but it, it actually just makes you more of what a traditional coach would be in other sports in non martial arts sports, you know, and you mentioned in their arm bar and that's one thing that I haven't done yet. I haven't really taught submissions in it. Mine's more have been, uh, positional. And then, mm -hmm. so how, how do you approach teaching a submission without going through a step-by-step -step technique? Because that's something that I'm like, how can I teach them a Kimura without telling them, you know, figure four grip, you want to do this, then you're going to do that, and this is what you're looking for, and this and that. How, how, do, you, how do you teach techniques or submissions with, with this approach? Awesome. So we're going to start here in our Kimura position. It looks like this. I mean, just put everyone in a Kimura grip on their partner with their hands separated. Your goal, keep the hands separated and eventually put their hand behind their back. It's going to look like this and we'll start here. But I always do sort of this rule or this thing with like submissions where you have to be able to pin someone. You have to be able to maintain that initial state of whatever the sub is. You know, I have to be able to keep the hand separated and then I can push it behind the back. But I might show like finishing mechanics and I often will. Hey, there's two ways I can really finish it. It could be like a pushing Kimura or a pulling Kimura. If they happen to get their hand on the mat, hey, I'm going to probably look to do more of a pulling motion where I think of lifting the elbow. If I can keep them on their side. Now we have the opportunity to do more of a pushing finish where I can push this hand behind their back to achieve the break, right? And that's just me explaining how a thing works to you. That's not me telling you step one, two, three, four. I'm just explaining the mechanics of how this works. And I'm putting you in that position. Then I'm going to do a series of games that will help you build the skills around it. So if we're just talking Kimuras, let's say. My, my, my most common... One is get first game, the hand is separated, it's up here. Keep the hand separated for five seconds. If you can do that, work to twist the arm, get the finish, right? Round two is we're going to go, I'm going to start cross face and underhook and side control. Your goal, get to a Kimura grip. Boom. Then I'll go, we're going to start bottom player is in side control and they have cross shoulder fit post inside bicep tie your goal just isolate the far arm get two on one or whatever get that arm away from the body combine all of that we'll have worked on the separate skills that we needed right because well actually actually truthfully i would then go one stage back which is just pin this person right keep this person pinned inside control stay past their legs chest to chest as often as possible. Don't let them get to their knees, right? We'll play that. Because at the end of that, I will have put you in scenarios to learn all the requisite skills to be capable of doing a Kimura on someone. You can keep them pinned. You can isolate the arm. You can take that isolation and make it into a strong attachment to the arm and the Kimura grip. You can separate the hand and you know how to break it. Right? So That's like the practice design element of breaking that down for me. So have you ever had a newer practitioner just from not repping it? Has, has, have they ever had issues with completely understanding what you're looking for? You know what I mean? Like, is it, do they have a hard time with the, the simple, the simpleness of what you're asking them to do? You know, Honestly, 
not really. Um, because like, because usually if it's something like a submission, I'm starting them very close to the end. Mm. It's one action for success. You know, it's like if I were teaching you to putt in golf and the first putt you did was three inches from the hole, you could do that pretty easily, right? You could totally understand it. It's a simple action. Tap that ball into this hole. Now there's requisite skills. Yo, eventually we got to get the ball up onto the green and then da 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 right? We work backwards, you know? But having that end goal be so accessible, that that's like the big context thing. It's like, boom, now they're locked in. They understand why we're doing all these things that we're gotcha. going to look at later. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. Um, have Have you noticed any like negative things or let, let's rephrase that. What is, have been some of the pros and cons of taking the ecological dynamics approach to jujitsu that you've noticed uh, since for this last year, if there are any cons? Okay. Uh, we'll talk about quick pros. They've been talked about at, you know, over and over, but I just want to talk about the main ones that I think are so important and why it's so valuable and why I usually try to encourage people to implement Okay, one, think of another blue belt you know that's just really good at grappling. You're like, damn, he's good. I bet that guy spars way more than you do. Yeah. And that's really, it's really it. He gets so much more live time. So he's obviously very good. You know, it's like, the, so that's one thing is if you train twice a week, you're an average human training twice a week. Most normal formats, you will get 30 minutes of live training in the week, 15 minutes session A, 15 minutes session B. If you are in my class, you will get 90 minutes of live training in that week, about 45 minutes a session. Just that alone is a huge bonus, not a bonus, huge value, right? That's one of the biggest values there. Second thing, um, Second really big pro is like feedback. You know, you get so much feedback on what is going wrong, what is going right when you're trying to play. If we, because here, here's the thing that happens is most schools that are running more of a traditional approach, they either do like situational, so like guard pass, sweep or submit, whatever, you know, you know, or they're doing full sparring. I don't get enough reps of something important in those. Whereas here, I'm going to put you in a situation, give you something to really focus on, and you're going to get a ton of attempts in short succession to see if you can make that happen. And when it doesn't happen, you'll figure it out. For example, the other day, we, we, are, we were actually doing arm bars this week. The first game, a guy just could not keep his partner pinned with his legs like at all. But by the second game, dude figured out how to use his legs now because he had so many failure points in a row, right? In a row. Let's say even if we were doing a more traditional, he drilled the arm bar and then we did positional sparring from the mount or something or whatever. He might never get to that arm bar again and it might be, so short lived that he never gets to develop any sensitivity. Um, so just being able to get that constant feedback and touches like to interact with the skill that you're trying to build that much is huge, right? Because humans are trial and error learning machines. That's literally how we learn a lot of stuff, right? Um, yeah, those are like two of the biggest benefits. Also like, man, we always like, Say jiu is so great for like your fitness and stuff. Man, I remember doing a lot of classes barely sweating back in the day. <laughs> like three rounds is not a lot of rounds, let's say. It can be, but it's just not. 45 minutes, it's a lot of training. You definitely worked a lot, you know. I see a lot of my students are in better shape. New students who want to lose weight, they will actually lose weight doing jiu-jitsu now. Right? Because they're training hard. Um Another benefit, injuries, way down. Oh, Super down. I rarely see anyone get hurt from an overzealous submission or 
roughness or whatever. Because here's my theory on that. If you never finish an arm bar against resistance and then you finally get an arm bar exposed in your live training round, that is the last 15 minutes of a class, it seems like such a fleeting window of opportunity that you better snatch that shit. But if earlier that day or, 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 or just in your life, you've had three minutes where you just had a guy's hand separated and you're pinning and learning to control this arm bar and how to do it effectively and boom, like the, you're, you're, you're just not so pent up about it. You know, you've been in those situations, both sides of it, you know, you spend so much time live too. Also like, it's just like, you don't go from zero to a hundred. You're just always going all class, you know? So you like, I, like, even when we do the full lock sub things, I don't see people getting hurt. And then when they live train after, they just don't really, part of it's like some of the culture we've built around it, but playing these like little games and working on these skills has really allowed them to just be safer as a whole. Um, cons, let's see. So cons are, it the, the biggest con, it's not a true con, it's just a challenge that should be addressed is that you'll probably want to figure out how are you going to touch on all the things that you think are important skills? You'll have to make those decisions, your prioritization of what is like, you know, the only feedback I ever have that's negative from a student is, man, I wish we could, I, it's, it's been a while since we've gotten a chance to dive into this subject, mm. diving into dark scenarios or this one or that one or whatever, you know, like that is going to be a legit con, but that is sort of, an always existing con of trying to program for a large group, right? That's not, that doesn't exist in only this narrow situation. That is just like a universal thing, right? Is that, you know, to be able to cover everything in a routine, predictable fashion, you either need many different levels of class where each one has different core focuses and core outcomes that you're looking to develop. Or, you know, it's like that, that's just a, general challenge for programming you know and that, that other con it's not really a con it is but like if you implement it you will lose some members mm, that's why too. but not not like in a negative way it depends on how you do it. I, I really didn't have much of this but i hear people who have this happen two reasons okay one is now shit got way more physical than it ever was. Right? Yeah. But like, how long was that person's jutsu timeline anyways? Because eventually it gets pretty physical. You know? Like, not to like, be t like, n negative about someone whose goals weren't that, but sports jiu-jitsu is you trying to control another person the whole time. You know, it's, it's a lot more physical, so it can be like, you might just not like that as much. Because think, in the other, in a traditional format, there's two things that happen. You get to learn a thing and feel nice, and you get to spar and feel nice. Now, you only spar and feel nice about your progress that you make during, it's just like, you just change what you're delivering. Of course, there will be some drop off. It's like if I removed a thing from my menu, and just gave you more of one or other item, you might not like that because you actually enjoyed that. That's, that's just a thing that will happen. It's not because like, oh, it's because of the approach. It's because you're changing the service you're delivering. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if this were a CrossFit gym and we went from using all like these certain equipments and I just pulled out the rower from the gym and we took away bumper plates, it'd be a different experience and you might not yeah. like it as much and that's okay that's just that that is a thing you know um yeah so that's that's like a negative but it's not really a negative it's you're changing what you're delivering it is it just is that is what will happen when anytime you implement a change it's not going to be for everyone and that's just normal you know you can't be like oh man i lost some students the other reason you will lose people is because the way you positioned everything was about how deep your knowledge was. 
that you were this magical textbook of very intricate things, or you taught in such a way, again, that was the exact same thing. You, you trained your audience to like a certain type of product. They loved training with you because you would give them very intricate, detailed leg lock sequences that were from here to here. This hand grips here. I pass here. Da, 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 da. It's, it's just because that's what you trained them on. That's what you delivered. That's what they liked. That's okay. They just understand that'll probably be a thing that'll happen, right? Um, that's all. But there's like other pros like, man, I have students like, man, I used to feel like I hit plateaus a lot. Now I don't really. Interesting. Because you know, they're forced to play all of jiu-jitsu all the time. Whereas if I just started to guard pass sparring, eh, you might not really get better. Or if you just do full sparring, you definitely probably won't get better. But if class is always forcing you to play with different skills and different engagements and really understand, you will get better. And that's what we find happens a lot. It's like, yeah, I don't like... I haven't heard about people be feeling like stuck. All I hear about is people who have things that they want to work on now, which is a way different sentiment. Feeling like you're not getting better versus feeling like you have things you want to work on are two very different sentiments for someone to express. Right. And now we have more of the latter people who have identified things they want to work on. And why can they do that? I think is because their awareness of what is really happening is way higher and the problems they have. And now they're thinking of a solution. Like I have a bunch, like I threw this out in like my school's discord. I'm like, Hey, what are some things you're trying to work on? And the answers were all over the place, but I knew all the answers were because of things that happened to them in training. Right. Which is what I want. I don't want someone to say, Oh, I need to work on my guard. You know, that's very generic. You know, like, I need to work on wrestling up from half. I can't do that often. Or I want to work on playing more open turtle referee position stuff. Da, 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 da. Or I want to be a body lock passer because over under is sort of failing me. Like that's what we're getting now in terms of students engaging with their own growth and progress. Yeah. Jordan Pressinger, one of my good buddies, uh, he does the Jordan TG Jiu Jitsu uh, mm -hmm. YouTube. Uh, one thing that I, the first time I had a conversation with him is he talked about, you know, these conceptual ideas. Uh, he called it the in-betweens. And I feel like with the the ecological dynamics approach, it definitely teaches a lot more in-between. Hey, you're in a three-quarter guard in this knee slice. Now you need to finish it or now you need to stop them, right? As to where it's, hey, initiate a knee slice. And I feel like that's been uh, a, a lot better because, like you mentioned, too, you have you have a broader idea of where something might be causing you issues in your jujitsu than a generalization of like, I can't hit a knee slice. Well, why? What position are you getting stuck in? Why are you getting there? Like, you know what I mean? So you have, you have more of a understanding of yourself of where things are going wrong because you're putting almost every single <laughs> scenario and trying to advance or defend from there. And I think that's, that's a, a great, uh, thing that it's been doing for me as well. What do you think needs to happen in order for the traditional list? I'll do the air quotes with that. <laughs> uh, people at jujitsu to start accepting this more and to be it to be more of a regular thing in the jujitsu community. Um, okay, the easiest way that I've always thought of, if I wanted to like help someone implement this, one. Okay, so one is like any time you try it, like the, one of the biggest challenges is when you frame it in such a way that it seems inaccessible, namely through terminology, the way we approach it, that stuff is a big barrier. Now there's like an argument like, yo, if we want to learn how to do something, you should probably just be willing to understand what's happening and read it and understand and whatever. It's fine. But that is probably, I would say that the number one obstacle is jargon for most people. And that I, I think honestly, that's like the biggest thing. So that's one of the biggest challenges to people implementing it is it feels inaccessible because it's hidden behind cons like so many things that they don't understand. Like, yo, pop quiz, what's an affordance? <laughs> but I don't know. What's a constraint? Is it this or is it this? Is it a rule or is it a 
this or is it that, you know, like all these things. So I always think the easiest way is, yo, if we can start sharing what we're doing, like the games, what we're, you know, that is the easiest way because then people can see what's happening. One of the challenges though, is you, you as a coach, you can't rely on other people's games for very long. Right. Because you have to be making these for your room and you have to sort of know what's really happening to design a good game. Not saying that like people don't know what's really happening, but you have to be able to communicate what's happening. And like, what is important here? What is noise and what is signal, right? Like what is important here? That is a challenge, I think. Because people always will like message like, yo, do you have some games for this? Yes, but are you, what are you gonna say about it? How are you gonna frame it? What are you gonna focus their attention on? What, how, you know, like that's, I think so you have to start thinking of it a little bit better or not better, a little bit differently. And how are you going to communicate these things? Um, that's another challenge. I think the third challenge is not being okay with not willing to give it a long enough time to see what really happens. It's like constantly opening the oven to see if the thing is cooked. It's like, yo, you're making it take way longer. It's not going to happen. Right. And also backpedaling off, you know, like, you know, like, oh, I tried it. It was this. Now I only do a game here or there or whatever, which is still fine. And that's the thing too is like, I'm sure somewhere I know there's like, there are some hard lines where like, yo, IP and eco death match. You can't do both. Maybe we don't know what we don't know yet as well. Right? There could very much be that too. I don't think it's, you know, it has to be so absolutist if we want people to embrace and think of the ideas and things like that, right? If we want them to engage with the material and people just, there, there's a lot of like commitment to. We're going to suddenly like, I, one thing secretly is like, you were previously the most important person in the room because you were the teller of knowledge. And now you have to be the person who sets people up to figure stuff out and make it happen on their own. And that can be hard because it's like when pre we're like, ah, oh, and now I don't know what's my job. What's my role. You know, that's a, a legit thing, but you know, yeah. The, the thing I would suggest though is, hey, if you want to like dive in, you just got to dive in. The challenge most people also have is they might not have enough control over their training environment, over the classes they teach, over their schools, you know, structure. One of, like, I'll just tell you actually another challenge we had is like, I have brown belts that are sort of nervous about running class in this way because I, I just don't get not what we're trying to do, but I don't get how I can best communicate what they should be focused on intention, attention wise, how to best cue them without going into put your left hand here. Yeah. <laughs> and that's okay. It's just a skill gap, right? Um, just, you know, that, that I find is also one of the challenges. Like, uh, you know, you just, you might not be comfortable with that element of it. Perfect. Hey, well, Kabir, Thank you so much for coming on the show today, man. I like to end every conversation with the same question. If you could give one tip to a brand new white belt starting in jujitsu, what would it be and why? Let's see. So one tip, um, the number one thing, you know, it's not going to be the, like the generic, Hey, keep training, blah, blah, blah stuff. Cause that is whatever. The number one thing I can really suggest to you is reflect on what is happening. Seek to just understand what is happening to you. Don't care if you do, don't care if you do a single positive action. If you can just identify why you're dying, that's super valuable. That should be like your primary thing is just seek to understand what's happening. Reflect, reflect, reflection is probably the most important thing because otherwise, like, and I'm not saying reflection, like the sad car ride home reflection. I'm saying thinking about what happened, what worked, what didn't work. I wonder why that didn't work. What could I do next time? Right. And part of reflection is like also ask a lot of questions. Ask, be an engaged learner. 
Perfect, yeah, man. That, that would be it. I appreciate your time today. If people want to follow you and check out all, uh, all the things that you're doing with coaching, you, your Instagram, I, I did a little bit of a deep dive on it. You got some great tips on there for new coaches and whatnot. If they want to follow you and check out uh, all your stuff, where can they find you at? Man, Instagram is easiest at Kabir Bath. You can follow me there, message me. I'm super happy to talk about coaching. Um, yeah, that's probably the primary place for this type of conversation and engagement. If you're ever in sort of that Vancouver area, you want to stop by my club, Kaboom BJJ, Surrey, BC. Um, happy to have you. We have drop ins all the time. Come on through. It'd be great. Perfect. I'm only a couple hours south of you down in Washington. So maybe one day I'll make it. Nice. <laughs> so, hey, but, man, thank you once again. This was a great conversation. There's so much more that we could go into and have a, a longer discussion, but it uh, sounds like both of our families are. are <laughs> so, uh, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show today, man. It was a, it was a great conversation and uh, it's definitely more palatable. And I think we accomplished our goal of making it easier for people to understand what this is and, and the pros and cons and, you know, what to look for in it. So I just want to thank you for that, man. Awesome. Yeah. I'm always happy to be a part of this discussion. I think there's just so much value that if we can break down sort of those like barriers of access, which is, you know, the key, you know, if we can make it something that people can understand, they can see. And also like, I feel like there's not a lot of talk always about the benefits and why we do it and what we've seen. I think, Anytime we can hear someone's story of implementation, it's really useful too. Absolutely. So thank you guys so much for listening to Watch Home. If you guys want to go check out Kabir, everything's going to be down in the, the description below. Thank you guys so much for listening and watching at home. We'll catch you later. And remember, no oil checks here. Thanks. Peace. <laughs> Peace. <laughs>